I call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. <coughs> like to certify closed session. Is there a motion? I certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, discussed only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law, and that only such public matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza? Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Uh, we now move on to item 3.1, the Pledge of Allegiance. Do we have a student? Um, oh, there we go. Wait, it's, we have a young man who's going to lead us. Can you tell us your name and what school you go to? I'm Jeremy Smith, and I go to Twano Middle School. And what grade are you in? Seventh. All right. Awesome. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. Ms. Hurst, would you take attendance, please? Dr. Beers. Here. Sorry. <laughs> Ms. Cook. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Ms. Ombi. Here. Uh, the next item is 3.3, .3, approval of the agenda. Madam Chair, I move approval of the agenda as presented. Thank you. And is there a second? That's mine. Second. Okay. Yeah, yes. Any discussion? Sorry, Madam Chair, <coughs> I'd like to, to move. Um, I don't have my agenda pulled up yet. Seven, seven point. Pull down to seven, please. Seven point zero eight, and move it to an, um, an additional vote, please. So we're going to move seven point eight to just an eight point five, just to be voted on separately. Madam Chair, as the person who made the motion, I'm okay with that. You're okay with that. Okay. Thank you. Any additional discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza? Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Mr. Beers? Aye. Mr. Kelly? I mean, Ms. Ownby? Aye. Thank you. All right. Um, item 4.1, the announcements and superintendent's uh, report. Dr. Heron? Good evening, Madam Chair. I'll begin my report tonight with a reminder for parents of elementary school students. Next week on February 28th, parents and students have the opportunity to get a first-hand look at our International Baccalaureate Primary Years Programme. As you know, James River Elementary is an authorised International Baccalaureate World School. The IB programme at James River supports students through an inquiry-based international and multicultural focus on learning. Interest, interested parents should mark their calendars for the open house at James River next Thursday, February 28th from 6 to 7 p.m. We also have two popular uh, Parent Academy events coming up as well. On February 27th, the Parent Academy is hosting a session on mindfulness and strategies to reduce anxiety and stress in young people while increasing student focus. This session is so highly sought after that we have exceeded our available seats already. In fact, more than 100 people registered to participate in less than one week. This by far is one of the most popular sessions to date. There are still, however, a few seats available for the March Parent Academy. This session will focus on positive discipline strategies. This workshop, being held on March 20th at 6 p.m., will offer techniques to establish strong, strong relationships with children, 5 to 12 years old, that allow parents to be firm yet kind when it comes to discipline. This program is presented by the family engagement staff from the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters. We are always grateful to have the support of organizations throughout our community to provide resources to our families and we thank them for participating in our academy evenings. 
One final announcement today. We've just announced a two-hour delay to school tomorrow morning due to inclement weather, uh, ice and snow expected uh, throughout this evening. Uh, but we look forward to seeing everyone two hours later in the morning. Madam Chair, that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Heron. I know there are a few school board members who have um, some announcements. I'll start with Ms. Cook and then just go down the diet. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to let everyone know that the School Liaison Committee met last week, and we uh, discussed Dr. Heron and her team presented <coughs> some of the um, items that are essentially mandated through the SOQ or through the uh, General Assembly uh, budget uh, to the Liaison Committee, and we discussed those and answered questions uh, about that. And uh, we all look forward to our joint meeting uh, coming. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Dr. Beard? Yeah, a couple of, <clears throat> couple of, um, couple of things. Uh, I want to uh, make sure, first of all, talk a little bit about the WHRO Pre-K-3 Summit that was held a couple of weeks ago uh, mm -hmm. down in um, Norfolk. And uh, we heard from the UVA Dean of Education uh, talk about um, a, um, uh, a new um, assessment observation tool to use with uh, younger children um, that stressed the importance of not just emotional and social support, uh, which many preschool programs are, um, are, are very good at, um, but to also include a clearer alignment of academic objectives and instruction to really learn how to differentiate criteria for classroom observations uh, and once again engagement and interaction um, during your learning is key. Our own Bright Beginnings program was identified as one that integrates the emotional, social, and instructional support needed to become successful learners. It was also recognized as one of the few preschool programs in the state that includes children with special needs. <clears throat> and then, uh, I, God, I've lost track. I think it was last week. <laughs> I, went, I attended the Advanced uh, Ed Conference at William & Mary. Um, along with Dr. Worley, who was there, as well as uh, some other um, teachers and staff members. Uh, the focus was on CTE and the preparation of skills for jobs out there. We heard from some people from the Southwest where um, uh, the population has been declining, um, and they were particularly um, interested in preparing their students for the jobs in their community. Uh, although it was fairly clear from uh, observations on other members uh, of the audience as well as um, our main speaker that um, the concern about preparation for jobs uh, that won't be there. It's better to prepare students for a variety of jobs in a variety of venues. And Dr. Worley also did us proud. She was able to name that final tune in a presentation that um, Dr. Jeff Smith gave, and she, uh, I, I, I can't remember all the prizes that she got, but she was showered at the end of that meeting. Um, that's all I have to say right now. Thank you, Dr. Beers. And I think Ms. Taylor has yes. an update. <laughs> On Valentine's Day, I got to attend a SEAC meeting. Um, so I'll share with you um, some of the things we discussed at that meeting. Um, that includes moving forward with our discussion groups related to best practices for inclusion so we're moving forward with that. Um, also, SIAC wants everyone to know they have a Facebook page. So if you search WJCC Special Education Advisory Committee on Facebook, you'll be able to see some of the training opportunities that we discussed at the meeting, as well as advocacy opportunities. Our next meeting will be on March 14th. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Any additional comments? OK. Um, moving on to recognition of students and staff, Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tonight we recognize six Lafayette High School female athletes for being named to the National Field Hockey Coaches Association High School Academic Squad. This program recognizes high school juniors and seniors who have achieved a minimum unweighted cumulative grade point average of 3.5 out of 4.0 during the same semester as their sports season. Four of these young ladies also earned Scholars of Distinction as a result of having a 3.9 unweighted grade point average. Two of our honorees could not be with us this evening. However, we will announce their names in recognition of this accomplishment. Students, as your name is called, please join us up front to be recognized. 
Bailey Gentry. Jacqueline Baszler, Scholar of Distinction. <laughs> Elizabeth Kennis, Scholar of Distinction. <laughs> Carlisle Orlowski, Scholar of Distinction. Morgan Slimmy, Scholar of Distinction. <laughs> and Alexandria Turan. Congratulations for this outstanding accomplishment. If I could ask Coach Enstrom to join us at the front of the room for the photograph. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, there's just one other uh, notice this evening. If you notice all the wonderful posters in front of the dais this evening recogni recognizing School Board Appreciation Month, thank you to those students who've done posters to, uh, to recognize our board members. And thank you again for your service to our school system. Thank you. <laughs> Chair, that concludes our recognitions. We look forward to, more, to recognizing more individuals at the next regular meeting in March. It, including our 2019 Teachers of the Year. That's exciting. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Okay, moving on to item 5.2. This is our school spotlight featuring Tuano Middle School. Tonight, the school spotlight shines on the Tigers from Tuano Middle School. The school has a unique outdoor learning opportunity that is making a splash with students. Tuano Principal Tracy Jones is here with her team to tell us all about it. Ms. Jones, welcome. Thank you. Madam Chair, distinguished school board members, and Dr. Heron, it's our pleasure to be here with you this evening to share this wonderful experience that over 3,000 students have experienced over the years. Um, it's been something that's a tradition of sorts. Um, we thank um, our PTSA, our teachers, all their hard work, and our wonderful students for representing us well at this um, site that we go every year. They keep inviting us back. Um, so we have some wonderful students with us tonight and two teachers, Mrs. Kate Chall is behind me, hopefully. And um, Mr. Ogburn will give you more information from the teacher side about this experience. Yes, and they are here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Jones. Um, this began about 16 years ago as a way for me to get my students out to interact with nature. And it's kind of grown to where we take our whole seventh grade every year. So over the years, we've been able to offer this to thousands of students who've come through our school. And uh, Besides being fun and exciting, and very memorable for the students, it really supports our life science curriculum by giving background knowledge that we use throughout the year with the students. Um, again, we have to thank our principal, our PTSA, and WJCC Transportation that every year helps us out to provide this for our kids. Um, for more on what goes on during these trips, I'm going to turn this over to my wonderful colleague, Kate Chaw. Thanks again for having us here tonight to talk about our trip. Um, I have some wonderful students here to, um, who actually helped us develop this sway to present our topic. Um, as Mr. Ogburn said, it does support our curriculum, and we do refer back to it frequently um, throughout the year, throughout our curriculum. It also um, specifically relates to several state standards that are embedded in our curriculum. So uh, I listed those there. I'm not going to read them. but 
Um, so I have two of my students, Jeremy Smith and Taylor Dow, to start um, lead us through the presentation, and Mr. Ogren's student, Ella Gosling. Um, I wanted to go on this field trip because I'd never been canoeing, and I also, after looking at pictures and videos in class, um, it looked really interesting, especially the mud mask part. Um, some of my classmates said they wanted to go so they could go outside, and because they'd never been on a canoe, um, because they sounded like a fun way to explore and learn, um, they wanted to go so they could learn about pollution and the bay and so they could get out and see nature. And it was a chance to get to know their classmates better by communicating. There are some pictures. That was quick. <coughs> <laughs> and next question will be... Personally, my favorite part of this field trip was the canoeing um, and taking the net and fishing up all the fish and crabs and other organisms. Some of my classmates' favorite parts were the Bay Saver game, they liked the mud masks, they learned about camouflage, and they had an insane fun time. <laughs> Some pictures of what we did on our field trip. <coughs> Oh, wow. And now I turn over the last question. <clears throat> River High Five! Yeah! River High Five! Hey, River High Five in the battle! Let's go! River High Five! Woo! Right there! Right there! <laughs> 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 Something new I learned on this trip was that there are different organisms that I never heard of before. And that there are many and that we learn how to improvise and how us Virginia us Virginians impact the waters and how fish shoot their scales off in self defense and how fertilizers might be good but it's bad for the bay. If and that if we don't take care, many things in the water will die. And realize how manufacturers slash unnatural goods can affect our waters. I saw how many states, and also they saw how many states influence the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Here's a video. <laughs> <laughs> and here's a video of me singing about science. <laughs> and removing the population. <laughs> and reducing fertilizers. Woo. Free. Free. That's it. Woo. Yay, Jeremy. Thank you for supporting this amazing educational experience. They have some tokens that they wanted to provide you guys from our trip. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. I think before you leave the dais, some board members may have comments or questions. Ms. Cook? I'm just, can you tell us a little bit about the excursion, what river is it on, where, where you go, where you launch? And We went to the James River, and, uh, oh, I meant the Chickahominy River. <laughs> Close enough. And um, the thing what it was like was that it was cold, and the water was really cold, and it was really murky. 
and there's a lot of little creatures floating in the water. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Beers? No, that, that was a question I had. I, I wanted to know where. But it, it is an enormous watershed, isn't it? Yes, sir. It goes sir. out into that bay. And there's no other bay like it in the world. So we're, it's, it's good that you guys are out there learning about it. That's great. Yes, sir. Mr. Keller? It looks like you guys had a really fun day, and it was a really great day of learning, and uh, I just appreciate you sharing that with us. It was uh, it's uh, great to see, you. and it's great to see too that uh, that's, you know, a, a Tuano tradition that we you do it every year, year after year, and, and uh, all the students that come from Tuano have that shared memory, so I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, how, do you uh, how do you guarantee that you're going to have a beautiful day like that? I mean, that was a beautiful day. Do you guys actually like look at the weather report and? Yes. Yeah, so the weather plays a big part, and that's why we are really so thankful for transportation because they work really hard with us, and Miss um, Jones and our other fellow teachers work really hard to make sure that we keep the kids safe because every day this year in particular was really challenging for making sure that we have a good day for the kids to go out. So. Um, it, we just have to play it by ear, and everybody has to be flexible. Great. Additional comments? Young? Yes, and thank you so much for doing that. Can you name one other state besides Virginia that is part of the watershed? Oh, was this a test? <laughs> well, part of our watershed in Virginia. Just another state that contributes water to the well, Chesapeake Bay. Maryland. Um, Maryland. Yeah, Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> Could be one. There's also, um, Pens is it Pennsylvania can come down to the water, the Chesapeake Bay watershed. It's always fun when I'm driving around because uh, I have my grandchildren that live everywhere. But seeing a sign that says that this river goes into the Chesapeake Bay, it's kind of surprising sometimes. But did you also know that Congressman Whitman has a doctorate in the Chesapeake Bay? I don't know if you're teacher knows that he might that might be a good resource for you to contact and have him ask him to come and speak to your class anyway thank you so much thank you and i just wanted to share my oldest who's 22 and a senior in college did this as a seventh grader at tuano and he told his three siblings what a cool thing that it was and they were all so sad when they went to hornsby and now blair so <laughs> they forgot to do it uh, he still rubs it in their face because that was a really cool day. So I know how much fun you had because I remember waiting for him to come home. And it it's a very long day. It's more than a school day because us parents were waiting in the parking lot for the students to arrive back. So that's a great opportunity. That I'm glad that the division is able to offer that to you all. Thank you so much for sharing that experience with us. Did have a great have, night. Did have one of those places? Okay, moving on to um, citizens' comments. I, this is an opportunity for folks to um, come. Okay, I'm going to, who do I go to first? You? Mr. I'm Kelly. Here. Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> it is at this point in our meeting where citizens are invited to address the board. Those citizens desiring to speak should have submitted speaker cards to the clerk prior to the start of tonight's meeting. These speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their names for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. It is the board's interest and desire that all comments are heard and respected. Hence, citizens are asked not to engage in plotting, verbal outbursts, or any other type of demonstrations during the presentations. Personnel matters are not considered in public meetings. Therefore, the board requests that all speakers refrain from making references to specific individuals in any form or fashion. Though the board does not respond to your comments during the meeting, your comments are being heard and appreciated. Each speaker is allocated three minutes to make their presentation, and the board asks that you respect this time limitation. Also, please be reminded that no time may be yielded to another speaker. Your acceptance and adherence to these guidelines will be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Madam Chair. My instructions are concluded. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Ms. Hummel. Uh, Genevieve Bennett. Good evening, Williamsburg, James City County School Board and parents. My name is Genevieve Bennett, and I'm a parent of a seventh grader at James Blair Middle School. First, I would like to thank the school board for taking action in regards to the events discussed during previous school board meeting. The addition of Dr. Murphy to James Blair should hopefully provide some insights as to how we can move forward. While leadership changes, 
Changes bring a fresh perspective. We must not lose sight of the issues that spurred the change. In my comments last month, student safety was my top concern, and those concerns still remain valid and will continue until I believe the issue has been adequately resolved. As a parent, student safety is an important is paramount and non-negotiable. I also understand that it is unrealistic to expect per, uh, perfection all the time as issues arise, but they should be the exception and not the rule. I look forward to hearing how the school board plans to address the issues raised by myself and other parents from James Blair during our last meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly Hundley. Good evening, Kimberly Hunley speaking on behalf as the president of the Teachers Association. So tonight you have before you, um, we did a budget survey of our members to find out what their priorities were. So I've attached it to your popcorn tonight. And um, of course, as you can see, we're right on track with salary and pay, pay increases. That was number one priority. But not far behind that was class size. And I was very, um, amazed at some of the comments. Uh, we, we're a wonderful system. We have a lot of students coming in and we're going to really need to look at staffing because some of our classrooms are to the max. And then when um, special ed students are put in with the classes too, it's even larger. And so there was a lot of comments about that. And special ed was right there too. We just need a lot more support with um, special ed staffing. Peop there, um, teachers that need training, that feel like they need training to help with that. And um, one thing that when we asked what was something that was not quite a priority, uh, a lot of things came up with technology from middle school with the, the little computers, that Chromebooks that come home. And um, I will be sharing this information with Dr. Heron on Thursday, so she'll be more specific. But I think we might want to look at how the students are using those because that was something I wasn't anticipating a lot of comments on how students are using those and then also a lot of um, questions about alternative ed so I know this is not I would make a guess that next year in budget there's a lot of comments about or can we look at alternative ed of some sort that we have a lot of students coming with emotional um, issues uh, we are getting some trauma training but teachers, it's, there's anxiety and issues with students, and not only do they need more support with um, teachers, but also a lot of school counselors came up in this uh, report. Can we get some more school counselors to help with, with the students that we are receiving? So um, I will be giving Dr. Heron a full report on this, but you have the top five priorities to look at. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hundley. Okay, moving on to the consent agenda, um, we need to approve item 7.1, personnel actions, 7.2, approval of minutes from the following meetings, January 22nd and February 5th, uh, item 7.3, financial report and monthly bills and payroll for January 2019, 7.4, resolution R-5-19, school social work week, 7.5, <coughs> um, Resolution 6-19, National Foreign Language Week. 7.6, Request for the Use of Facilities, Harvest Church at Berkeley Middle School. 7.7, .7, Retire Policy, i.e. Organization of Instruction. We're going to move item 7.8 to below 8.4. So item 7.9, Revised Policy, EEBA, Authorized Use of Vehicles and um, 7.710 review policy EFM environmentally sustainable practices. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move approval of the consent agenda with the modifications presented this evening. A second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza? Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Ongby. Aye. Uh, moving on to action items. Um, 8.1, uh, approval of school calendar for um, school year 2019-2020. Is there a motion to approve? Madam Chair, I move approval of the school WJCC, uh, the 2019-2020 school calendar. And is there a second? Second. Any discussion? 
Yeah, so um, you want to talk about what the oh, General hello. Assembly did? I would love to talk about what the General Assembly did. Uh, so as you will recall, at the last meeting, I was sharing with you uh, the potential impact of some bills in the General Assembly. And today I can update you and let you know that House Bill 1652 has been passed by both the House and the Senate. Uh, in essence, it eliminates the post-Labor Day start requirement and repeals the King's Dominion Law, which was originally passed in 1986. There on the screen, you see that uh, the bill will allow school divisions to set the first day of school so that students arrive uh, no earlier than 14 days before Labor Day. And if a board were to elect to do that, they would have to close schools from the Friday preceding Labor Day through the holiday. So this will certainly have the potential to give us some flexibility uh, in future years. And as Dr. Heron shared at the last meeting, the superintendents in the region are already discussing how that, that might roll out in the future. Uh, just as a reminder, at the last meeting, we presented to you on behalf of the calendar committee and Dr. Heron a draft calendar that included 180 instructional days, built-in professional development, and early release days related to parent-teacher conferences, staff work days, and exams. Following that presentation, we posted the calendar online for nine days uh, and sent out uh, messages through school messenger to every parent and employee as well as posting links on our social media channels asking for feedback. During that nine days, we received 421 comments about the 1920 uh, draft calendar. Overwhelmingly, the, the comments were positive and overall supported the draft plan, uh, particularly of interest to parents were extended breaks uh, the day before Thanksgiving, <clears throat> the full two weeks at Christmas, and having Easter break aligned with or adjacent to Easter. Uh, there were some questions about the number of early release days and a request for us to look at that in future years, and a couple of comments about the effectiveness of back-to-school nights at high schools and whether or not those were actually necessary. In addition to the online comments, we um, heard from the Board of Elections for the county, and the director pointed out that March 3rd is a presidential primary and that higher than average turnout is expected for that primary and that there were concerns about the impact of increased foot traffic as well as parking issues for the schools. So at that point, uh, Dr. Heron um, looked at the calendar and is making an amendment to the draft for you. You have a copy there at your seat. Um, and that includes using March 3rd as a delayed opening. Um, historically, the greatest voter turnout is before uh, folks go to work and then after they get off work. So a delay will um, provide an added layer of security by uh, having students out of the building when there's a large crowd and then also improving the traffic flow with cars not having to compete with buses uh, for entrance to school parking lots. So that is the only change to the school calendar draft that was presented to you last week, or at the last meeting, I'm sorry, um, is that designation of a two-hour delayed start on March 3rd, 2020. At this time, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Questions, Ms. Cook? It just feels like last week. It does feel like last <laughs> week. Any time I get to spend with you all is just, I carry it oh, with me always. just lost oh. credibility. Miss <laughs> um, Cox, um, are, do you have any information about other school divisions and whether they also tend to uh, start school late on March 3rd? So I made an inquiry to our regional calendar committee, and at that time, school divisions were not making plans to do that. However, since then, I do know that some other schools in the region have heard from their voter from their uh, board of elections offices. So. They just haven't announced anything yet if they do plan to make a change. Um, yeah, I, I plan to support this tonight, but I do want to just express some thoughts regarding um, future calendars uh, if, if the plan is to start before Labor Day. Uh, well, I don't have any opinion on that. Uh, as a school board member, as a resident of this community, I, I do know we rely heavily on tourism tax dollars. And if the rest of Virginia uh, decides to start before Labor Day. That could have an impact on uh, tax revenue coming into the county in particular, but certainly in the city um, with regard to Bush Gardens and Colonial Williamsburg. So if they see drops in attendance, um, that could impact 
uh, our funding going forward. Um, I, it's also possibly a workforce issue here, but I think more important uh, is to look at the, so I don't know how closely, Dr. Heron, you've talked with the county about that, but it's some, certainly something that, for our budgetary planning purposes, should be on our radar. And that is something that the calendar committee would seek direction from both the school board and the superintendent before we started down planning for a future year. Well, and whatever we decide to do may be irrelevant. If, every, if, if from Richmond to Virginia Beach decides to do it, if that's where our tourism attractions are drawing mm -hmm. from during that time of the year, the tax revenue is going to go down regardless of what we do. Are there additional comments? Kelly? So, um, also in going forward, if, uh, since we are on a regional calendar, how, how is the, do you have any I, a feel for how the region is going to decide when school will open? I would imagine we'll be discussing that at, at our superintendent's meeting because there's a lot of differences of opinion. I think everyone sees it as a benefit to students to finish before uh, the winter holiday break. But there's a lot of planning that needs to go into it, both in terms of contractual calendar, school calendar, communicating with parents, just looking at all the, the impact, and including the economic impact as well. Uh, Virginia Beach is also highly impacted because of tourism at the beach, and we're in a similar position here. Because yeah, this affects graduation day. I mean, Everything. Can have to change, and so there's a lot of, it's a lot of impact to start, and it gives us a little more flexibility for some periods, but it's also um, very impactful for the rest of the calendar. Yes, and I know we'll have to make a decision to go there or not fairly soon, even for something as simple as getting the graduation date on the on the calendar, because that's huge for booking the facility. Right, but the, the, just for the public's benefit, we're not changing in 2019, so we're not impacting any pre-planned vacations or any of that. We will have to make a determination shortly about what we do in 2020 so that they can make appropriate plans, because lots of people try to do that a year in advance, et cetera. Yes, sir. If there are no additional comments, <clears throat> we have a motion and a second. Ms. Serza? Thank you, Ms. Cox. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Okay, moving on to item 8.2, award a contract for invitation for bid 19-13723, Chiller Replacement at Matthew Whaley Elementary School. Madam Chair, I move that we award a contract for invitation for bid number 19-13723, Chiller Replacement at Matthew Whaley Ele Elementary School to Warwick Mechanical in the amount of $312,000. And is there a second? Second. Any discussion? None. Ms. Serza? Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. <coughs> Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Ombi? Aye. Item 8.3, revised policy EBCD school closings. Madam Chair, I move for approval of revision of policy EBCD school closings. Second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none. Ms. Serza? Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Zombie? Aye. Item 8.4, revised policy EFC, Energy Management Conservation Policy. Madam Chair, I move approval of the re revision of policy EFC, Energy Management Conservation Policy. Or second. Second. Discussion? Ms. Hummel, do you want to talk about just the campus versus the... Oh, yes. Um, so, Mr. Kelly, you brought up the um, question about campus versus building. Yes, I did. And we ran it past the attorney, <coughs> and the attorney was fine with changing it to campus. Keep it, at, well, keep it as is at campus. But thanks for bringing that, uh, that up because I think energy conservation is just as important uh, off 
site on the fields and in the parking lots and the lighting, uh, just as important as our buildings. So thanks for bringing that up. Any additional comments? Second, Ms. Serza. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. I can't read it. Ms. Cook. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. Ombi. Aye. Okay, uh, now we've, we've moved action item 7.8 to 8.5, revised policy JECA, admission of homeless students. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move, move approval of policy JECA, admission of homeless students. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Yes, um, I ask that this be moved because during our last discussion when it was explained, um, I mean, Having done a lot more research um, between McKenny Vento and the Migratory Education Act, um, I'm, I'm very concerned that um, the school division becomes responsible for, for federal law, and um, not that we shouldn't be, I'm not saying that, but I am concerned, especially for these two, because without documentation, we don't know what we're really getting. And I'm concerned that, um, I, this is far above my level, but I would certainly would like those who are in authority, like our congressmen and senators, to pay a little bit more attention to what they're voting in. I do understand the concept of people that are homeless, may not have documentation. I also understand that people that, are my, uh, that fall under the category of migratory workers or fishermen may not have documentation, but that affects our, uh, the amount of money that we are spending, and as a taxpayer and as a person who is supposed to be uh, in stewardship of our tax dollars. I cannot support this policy even though I understand that, um, that we really have no choice. So I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you, Ms. Young. Are there additional comments? So at the end of the day, the school system cannot not, apl not apl comply with federal law. And I do understand that. I do understand it. So, and certainly this isn't the only <clears throat> piece of federal law that impacts our, our bottom line. I mean, no, what, I mean special I education, I think they, the federal government contributes, what was the last, 16 percent, 17 percent? a lot larger when it started. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we absolutely, it's an investment in our children to educate anyone who walks through our doors, and that's our obligation. So I will support this. Additional thoughts, comments? Is it second, Ms. Serza? Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? No. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. <coughs> Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ombi? Aye. Okay, moving on to item 9.1, presentation of superintendent's proposed FY20 operating budget. Before I toss it to Dr. Heron, I'd like Mr. Kelly and Ms. Cook to read a statement. Madam Chair, as a member of the school board of Williamsburg, James City County, I have an interest in the <coughs> fiscal year 2019-2020 school budget because my wife is an employee of the WJCC schools. However, I believe I am able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in the public interest. Mr. Kelly, Ms. Cook. Thank you, Madam Chair. As a member of the School Board of Williamsburg, James City County, I acknowledge that I have an interest in the fiscal year 2019-2020 uh, school budget because I'm an employee of the Williamsburg Health Foundation. However, I believe I'm able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in the public interest. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. We are delighted this evening to present the superintendent's <clears throat> proposed budget. This budget proposal supports over 12,000 students, including pre-K, 16 schools, and over 1,700 employees. Our schools are a valued, integral part of the city of Williamsburg and James City County. We are fortunate, <coughs> me, fortunate to have strong support of our community and the respect of parents, business leaders, and elected officials. Our funding partners, city and county, have consistently invested in our schools, our teachers, and in our students and we are very grateful for their ongoing support. 
The school division's reliance on county and city funding is due to WJC schools only receiving about 25% of its funding from the state. Federal funding provides less than half a percent of the WJCC schools annual operating revenue. This means that our localities continue to provide most of the funding to ensure a quality education is provided for all students in WJCC schools. We are very grateful for their ongoing support and I am proud to say that they receive a strong return on their investment. Our schools are among the highest performing in the Commonwealth. In fact, WJC is one of a handful of school divisions that have earned state accreditation for 11 consecutive years. This spending plan is designed to build upon that history of achievement. The fiscal year 20 proposed budget is purposefully aligned with the goals of the new strategic plan, Elevate Beyond Excellence. Key priorities include employee compensation, meeting the needs of all students, equity, safety and security, and most important of all, teaching and learning. Our most important resource in WJC schools is people. I'm referring to the committed employees of WJCC schools. Going beyond excellent requires attracting and retaining great people, teachers, administrators, support employees, all of whom contribute to a positive environment that it makes it possible for every student to learn. Providing fair compensation for all staff and especially for our teachers who are at the heart of our mission is a priority this evening. Therefore, this budget includes an investment of $3.8 million in our valued employees to move, move us closer to the regional market average in salaries. It proposes a 4% pay raise for all, a step increase coupled with an average of 2.5% for teachers and 4% for all others. If we are to attract and retain the best employees from teachers to bus drivers, we must compensate our employees fairly. This budget also sustains our investment in quality health insurance for employees. Currently, 27% of the operating budget is allocated to employee benefits, and more than 17 million of that directly supports uh, health insurance. For each individual full-time employee with a family who participates, WJCC contributes over $18,000 per year. This is an important piece of the compensation puzzle that greatly benefits all those who choose to access it. <clears throat> this budget is informed by data. For example, an analysis of teacher compensation compared to surrounding school divisions demonstrates we are seven out of nine in entry level teacher salaries for new teachers with a bachelor's degree, and nine out of nine in entry level teacher salaries with a master's degree. A comparison of regional and peer division staffing levels demonstrates we are one of three out of ten school divisions that have only one assistant principal at the middle school level. An analysis of support for English language learners shows the ratio of teacher to student with limited English proficiency is higher than our peer and regional school divisions. Teaching and learning is at the heart of what we do. The proposed budget includes an additional million dollars to fund instructional initiatives, programs, and additional instructional personnel. This budget also invests in educational equity, that is making sure every student has what he or she needs to be successful. Our student population is becoming more diverse, which is a positive thing, but it is imperative that we have the resources to meet the individual needs of all students. Therefore, over half a million dollars is invested in additional staff and resources to address the growing special education and English <coughs> learner populations. <coughs> Safety and security remains a priority for the school division with over half a million dollars invested in additional counselors and security officers. Review and alignment of funds within the various departments has also enabled us to budget for two additional buses to continue with the bus replacement plan, set aside resources to address specific equity needs based on data to the amount of 150,000, and realize over 1.5 million in savings. There is nothing in this budget plan that you have not seen or discussed before. We know that with full funding, we are able to meet the essential needs of our students and appropriately compensate our incredibly talented 
employees. Ms Ewing, well, our Chief Financial Officer, will now join me in presenting the Superintendent's proposed budget this evening. If possible, I would like you to hold your questions until the end of the presentation so that we may lay out the plan in its entirety. Thank you, Ms Ewing. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. It is my pleasure to be here this evening to present to you the superintendent's proposed budget for fiscal year 20. As you know, considerable work has gone into developing the superintendent's proposed budget. The FY20 plan is a balance of meeting established school board priorities related to the strategic plan, a review of available revenue, and meeting the division needs for the upcoming fiscal year as outlined from each of our cost center managers. Throughout the budget process, school administration made decisions based on one overarching question, what is the best for all students and staff? As you know, enrollment is a key component of the budget development process. Enrollment estimates drive our estimated revenue and our staffing model. We use FutureThink to assist and guide us with enrollment information and trends. This view provides a historical perspective with regard to enrollment within the division as of September 30th each year. Enrollment fluctuates daily, but September 30th is a benchmarking assessment for funding at the state level. Based on the low enrollment projection for FY20, we are anticipating an increase of nine students next year. In addition to enrollment data, we use the strategic plan's principles and priorities to guide the development of the budget to ensure the goals align with the plan and that it supports the needs and goals of the school division, taking into consideration the input of our stakeholders. Here's a look at the current revenue projection. The state revenue is slightly less than previously shared with you. Specifically, the percentage split between James City County and the City of Williamsburg shifted slightly, and line items were also reviewed and compared to history and some adjustments were necessary. Again, I want to remind you that we do not have a final state budget, so the top number could still change. <coughs> We are using the governor's proposed budget, including sales tax, to build our budget. We anticipate just under $4 million in additional revenue. You've seen most of these mandatory and essential expenditure increases previously. Aligned with goal one of the strategic plan, which focuses on academic achievement and college and career readiness, you will see additional instructional staff, in, including two special education teachers, an instructional assistant, and an additional half FTE to increase our social studies coordinator position to full time. Since our last presentation, we have received updated information from New Horizons, so we have adjusted our estimated increase for the regional program to just under 129000 <clears throat> Based on previous budget conversations with the board, Dr. Heron has also included funding for an assistant principal at each middle school. Positions are crucial as building leaders are charged with multiple tasks from leading an increasing number of special education meetings to handling student discipline matters to guiding instruction and staff development. The additional staffing has been identified as an essential need across all middle schools. Goal two of the strategic plan focuses on equity. Expenditure increases here are primarily for personnel to support the division's rapidly growing English learner and special education populations. As Dr. Heron mentioned, data demonstrates a critical need in these areas. There is also a half FTE for a gifted resource teacher to strengthen our ability to screen for and provide gifted services. The safety and security of students and staff remain a priority. That is reflected in goal four of the strategic plan. The budget proposal includes five additional school counselors that are needed to comply with changes in the standards of quality. Technology updates include licensing for enhanced security for Windows and Office 365. 
Finally, under this goal, we've included the security officers for each middle school who work in tandem with administrators and the school resource officers. Last week's anniversary of the Parkland shooting reminds us that we must never be complacent when it comes to school safety. Another area where we must be vigilant is employee and employee compensation. We have an incomparable team of teachers, administrators, and support employees. In order to retain those high quality employees and remain competitive with neighboring divisions in our recruitment efforts, we must provide the best salary and benefits possible. To that end, the FY20 budget proposal includes an average 4% salary adjustment for eligible employees. For teachers, that is a step increase and an average 2.5% raise. For other employees, it's an average of 4% without a step adjustment. We know that as a board, you appreciate the dedication of our staff and value all they do for children in our schools. We firmly believe that our community members and funding partners recognize the amazing work of our teachers and staff, and we are confident that knowing how woefully underpaid public educators are, they will fully support this proposed raise. As a reminder, providing a raise impacts not only next year's pay, but also an employee's long-term financial stability through VRS. We would love to offer an even bigger increase to our employees. They deserve it. Unfortunately, without more revenue, we cannot implement a larger raise without cuts to vital programs. We can, however, continue to offer three excellent health care plan options that include health, dental, and vision for a very reasonable price. On this slide, you also see the health care increase of $337,296. Based on guidance from the board, the minimal increase of 1.5% will be offset by employee contributions. Therefore, you see it as an expense here, but as a savings later in the presentation. So let's take a look at health care for a minute. About 1,300 employees participate in our health plan, so not every employee is impacted by changes to health care. Currently, the division is paying about 82.6% of the cost, and employees are paying approximately 17.4%. This proposal will shift the division's share to 81.4% of the cost, and employees will pay approximately 18.6%, with the employee cost going up approximately $328,000. We received the actual plan details last week from our provider. In some cases, employees on the Key Advantage 500 plan will actually see a decrease in premiums, beginning at $13 less per month. The greatest increase comes on the Key Advantage 250 plan, where employees with a family will pay $43 more each month. We previously had estimated that cost at $39, but when we received the final figures from our provider, it is $4 more each month. Again, I would stress that our health benefits are very good. Employees can choose from a high deductible plan that has the lowest premiums, the Key Advantage 500 plan, and the Key Advantage 250 plan. The biggest difference in these plans is the out-of-pocket expenses and deductibles. To briefly summarize the employee health care increases, the employee contribution for the high deductible plan will not change at all. As I mentioned, on the Key Advantage 500 plan, employees will actually see a decrease in premiums, with the greatest being a reduction of $156 a year for the employee plus family option. And employees selecting the Key Advantage 250 plan will see an increase in their premium up to $43 per month, which equates to an extra $516 a year for the employee plus family option. <coughs> Moving on to budgetary expenditures related to goal six of the strategic plan, you will see $13,440 allocated for technology services. This covers additional licensing for Synergy, our student data system, to support online registration.
We also have a number of savings in goal six, which is not surprising given that the goal focuses on organizational efficiency. On this slide, you will see savings from reductions in utilities, phone services, and attrition savings. This is also where you see the healthcare increase as a savings because it is being offset by the employee contribution. In total, we have nearly $1.6 million in savings through budget reductions and other savings. This graphic outlines that our focus is right where it should be, instruction. The expenditures by function and instruction makes up 73% of that total. And as you can see on this slide, 87% of our operating expenditures are spent on people, wages, and fringe benefits. In summary, our revenue increase based on the governor's budget and projected contributions from our local funding partners is just under $4 million. The mandatory and essential expenditures we have outlined for you tonight total approximately $6.3 million. <clears throat> when you factor in the $1.58 million in savings from realignment, efficiencies, and attrition, we need an additional $710,000 to fully fund this budget plan. This graphic shows the breakdown of revenue expected for this budget by funding source. 25% of our funding comes from state SOQ and incentive funds. 10% of our funding comes from state sales tax. A half percent comes from other revenue sources that we generate, such as building rentals, sale of equipment, and interest earnings. And the majority of our funding, or 65%, is reliant on the support of the localities. We are very grateful for the support that we have received from the City of Williamsburg and James City County to be able to provide a quality education for our students. Here you see all of the funding sources for our current budget as well as the FY20 budget proposal. Overall, there is a 3.4% increase year to year for the operating fund and a 3% overall increase for all funds. When you consider the mandated expenditures and those essential expenditures to support equity, safety, and much deserved employee compensation, we believe that the request is very reasonable. Our next steps in the budget development and approval process include a public hearing on Dr. Heron's budget proposal on March 5th. A joint meeting with our funding partners from the city and county is scheduled for March 15th. And the school board will discuss and approve the budget March 19th or March 26th for it to be delivered to the city and county by April 1st. This concludes our formal presentation of the superintendent's proposed FY20 budget plan. Dr. Heron, is there anything you'd like to add? Thank you, Ms. Ewan, for presenting this evening. Thank you, school board for considering this budget this evening. We believe that it represents a, a way forward with our strategic plan uh, for the next year, and we, we seek your support for the budget. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Ewing and Dr. Heron. Questions? Discussion? Ms. Um, I just wanted to thank, um, thank you and thank Dr. Heron for taking our comments last two weeks ago, whatever, and really, um, going back to the, the drawing board with relation to um, the benefits, because I, was, I left that meeting and we had an almost million dollar gap. And to see it reduced by 328,000 and still be able to retain the 4% um, uh, salary increase, um, I just think that that's a win-win for for everyone, and um, particularly when you take into consideration that the increase in salary goes into retirement, and, and you know it's it's it goes a lot further, and the fact that not a hundred percent of the the um, employees are benefiting from our benefits, it makes sense. I think that we stress that side of the budget. So anyway, I just wanted to thank you guys for 
for uh, working that out. Young? Yeah, if you'd answer the question for me, with the combination of a 2.5% uh, increase of salary for teachers and the step adjustment, what does that t t amount to percentage-wise, approximately? Lives it would be different for different... I'm sorry, could you repeat the question again? I'm, um, it asked for a 4% increase. And we've, the, for staff that are not teachers, I guess are not on the teacher scale, it's 4%. But I'm trying to understand the 2.5% for yeah. teachers with, and the step increase. I got that part, but what, what does that equal? Yeah, there's an average, the scale has an average of a 1.5% between each uh, point on right. the scale. So it is an average, and, and then there would be an additional 2.5% uh, above that again for teachers. So they come out with an average of 4%. Um, the scale has, has been finalized right now, and that'll be presented later in the year. I know there's the intent to put um, a little bit uh, extra at the beginning of the scale to attract beginning teachers, as well as the average throughout. Thank you. I'd like to um, add to Ms. Hummel's uh, thanks and uh, you know, for the hard work that it puts for the, uh, that goes into putting this budget together, but also to list, for listening and and adjusting. And I, and I um, I appreciate the commitment to the increase in compensation. I think that's mission critical. Um, I, I don't think the rest of our strategic plan works if we if we don't do a good job with that. So, and I too support an increase in overall compensation. Uh, for 100% of our employees, um, and and I and I appreciate that it wasn't done just in um, uh, to be fiscally conservative, which I appreciate, um, but also with data to suggest that we might benefit compared to our other uh, divisions nearby to shift to a little piece of to total compensation toward salary um, because we're slightly over invested there compared to, to others so I think that that is it's good to look uh, around us and see see what's going on so I'm, I'm excited to uh, put more money in, in people's pockets hopefully if, if we get the requests that we're asking for I'd also like to echo what dr. Heron said at the beginning of her remarks that 65 percent of our budget comes from the localities and that um, James City County and the city pay significantly more than our neighbors and so the local taxpayers here um, just by the formula that the state and all of its wisdom calculates for us uh, uh, our taxpayers uh, contribute a at a greater rate and so I, I think the county and the city should be thanked for that but the taxpayers as well and we should just be ever mindful of, of that that um, that they're just contributing more um, and then also, I haven't. I look forward to reading this cover to cover, um, but I, I, I'm going to be a little bit of a broken record on this. I, I want to be transparent moving forward in the future about our, our plans for increased compensation beyond this year, more counselors that we're going to need, pr uh, more special ed teachers, more uh, English language, uh, you know, more support for L's, more um, assistant principal, principals, hopefully a reduction in class size. Um, more buses, uh, more coordinators, whether they be for health and PE or CTE. So it's not just this year that we're looking at, but uh, increasing. And I, and I hope that that's somewhere in this document because I think we need to be clear in writing that our, our, in order to fulfill our strategic plan, um, we're, we are simultaneously being fiscally conservative, but also data driven and meeting our students' uh, needs, as I said earlier, at a higher price tag. Um, and then also, um, I'm excited about the equity piece. I, I think the, the focus on uh, emerging scholars and uh, ELL and SPED is great. I also think even though they're in a different strategic goal area, that the addition of counselors, and security guards, and APs will also help with equity. Um, so I think that, you know, it's, it's one of those areas where the strategic goals overlap. Um, but I also, um, I also am curious what else we're doing with existing resources and um, whether it be adjusting class size or you know adding more tutors 
I think we do a very good job, and when I'm looking at the emerging scholar piece, I think we do a good job using Title I money in elementary schools, but I'm still concerned about middle school and high school and what we're doing to meet the needs of every student. We have achievement gaps, and we have those gaps, um, whether it's English language learners or special ed, and we're adding more resources there, but economically disadvantaged okay. students, there's a gap there too. And so I'd like to you know, know, I, I hope that I find something in that budget that jumps out with, with regard to that. Um, so that's, anyway, that's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Comments? Mr. Kelly? Um, to, to jump off of what Mrs. Cook was saying about the General Assembly, when the General Assembly says that we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna say, we're gonna give a, a 5% pay raise to teachers, what they're really saying is that we're gonna be willing to pay 35% of that 5% to mm -hmm. the WJCC um, parents. So. Uh, is you know the, the governor says we're going to give you three counselors, or we're really going to pay 35 percent of three counselors, and so they just need to make sure that that's really a difficult message for the public at large to understand and to, rec and to receive. But um, that is what is as the way that the funding formula works. That's um, that's the way it, it shakes out. Um, the other thing is as far as as far as going forward, we should we should look at is if you look at your uh, your popcorn and the uh, the what the teachers have have in the uh, poll there have said, um, we really need to look at unburdening our teachers. So, you know, back in 2005, the teachers were, were, were teaching students, and then in 2008 and 10, we took away their teacher assistance, and then we raised class sizes, and then we said, well, we want you to do professional development, and then we want you to do learning plans, but we never took anything away. So, so we're just asking more and more of our teachers, and while they're always gonna say they need more salary, um, if you, if you cut their class size by five and then gave them a teacher assistant, they would probably appreciate just as much as a salary increase because of the, uh, of the demands that we're asking of our teachers. So I think we need to really look at that going forward. Um, you know, and, and not only look at it from a budget perspective, but just from um, what we're asking of our teachers and maybe we should ask less of our teachers for things that don't affect teacher students in the classroom. And, and really kind of make sure that what the demands that we're asking of our teachers, um, you know, professional development, yeah, professional development's great, um, doing all these things is great, but we are still adding additional burdens to the individual that we need to really be cognizant of going forward, so that we're, we're looking for their whole, their whole, whole compensation, really. Mr. Kelly, additional comments about the Budget. Young? Well, I was just looking at um, the priorities from our, our teachers, and um, I, I guess I'll just get class size has a huge impact not only upon um, we're talking about equity here when we talk about class size because our lowest achieving students need more help. And if you are teaching a class of 30 kids and um, Every, and you're supposed to be teaching every kid, uh, they're not getting as much help as they possibly could have. And, and I know uh, as a teacher uh, how difficult it is. I'm just looking at that. And I just remember when um, they reduced our class size from 21 to 18 for, for primary grades and what an impact that made upon um, what, what happens. I hear somebody laughing. I can hear, thank you. Because when, it, when it's reduced, those three extra students you know, things ex become exponential, and uh, reducing class size, class size has a huge impact upon what, what the teacher can do with kids. And so I think that's maybe something we should start looking at more. Yeah, I think, Mrs. Young, I think the chuckle was, you only had 21? <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, this is great. I, I'm sorry, I work for the Department of Defense, and uh, yeah. yeah, second best school district in the United States. But um, I do, I do think that that's something. Do they have more than twenty-one in those early childhood? I know you do, and I just love you for that because those kindergarten teachers—they're they're lucky to have you. But um, I'd really like us to talk more about that. Thank you, Ms. Young. Additional comments, Ms. Cook. Yeah, I just would like to ask a process question. So there's a public hearing on the fifth, and then we discuss it around a table on the fifth. 
and, and then we should be prepared to take action at the following meeting. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Or possibly the next one. We have an option of the 19th or the 26th. The 26th is a special one, though, right? It's only if we don't approve only, it. Right. right. And so if we're going to head in that direction, we probably should we'll know give indications mm -hmm. sooner rather than later. Is Dr. Beers? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I think given the constraints that we're uh, dealing with, um, I think this is a really good budget, a budget that reflects um, the needs of the school district as well as looking at the challenges that we have right now um, and the challenges that we'll have in the future. I look at this budget as a starting, as a sort of jumping off point because there are some other things that are going to be coming down the road in the next couple of years, um, and we're going to have to make uh, even probably harder decisions. One thing that I, I very much appreciated this time around was we had a, a, a lot more discussion about very specific areas with very specific numbers, particularly in the area of um, teacher compensation and benefits. And I really have, want to thank Mr. Baker for that because he really, for me anyway, uh, he really helped me uh, become much more uh, aware of how those pieces go together. And, uh, and I, I very much uh, appreciate it. Uh, I very much appreciate that. Uh, <clears throat> um, obviously, no budget takes care of everything. Um, we, there's, a, there's more work to be done. Um, I, you know, I'll make my little pitch for one, just one thing that I, I hope we come back to and, and, and we look at it seriously again. Um, and that is the creation of a bona fide uh, alternative ed program where students may actually be removed from classrooms or from a school because they will benefit more from a, uh, uh, a more highly structured program, working with experienced teachers who understand the nature of those students, and so I hope um, that we that we, we get back to that. But uh, other than that, um, um, I know we put a lot of time into this budget, and uh, but I feel that I uh, I uh, I'm I'm satisfied. I'm not you know super happy. But I'm satisfied we've done the best we can do, given the constraints, given, given uh, uh, where we are right now. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Any additional comments? Um, I would just like to sum up. I think my board colleagues uh, very eloquently stated how pleased we are with the hard work um, of staff and board and the dialogue. And I myself just wanted to point out again to the listening public and our funding partners, um, in order for us to move forward, this is a multi-year approach. And so we, the work does not stop with this budget. It will need to continue. And I think we can't lose sight um, as a community, um, recognizing the children that we're serving are, are distinctly different than they ever have been in the past. Um, as Ms. Cook noted, you know, the number of, of um, English language learners is increasing, the number of children with disabilities. As medical advances increase, you know, the number of micro preemies that are now coming to our kindergartners who are neurologically different um, than, than, than their typically developing peers are something that we as a, as a community will need to be prepared to address. And so just want to put that out there, that, that we're serving a very diverse group um, and, and demographics on the ground are changing. And so we need to be able to, to be creative and meet the needs of our teachers and staff, but also our students. <coughs> and so I thank everyone for their hard work. Thank you, Dr. Heron. So moving on to um, board matters. This is an opportunity um, for board members to share comments and requests. And so we'll start with yeah. Ms. Cook and just, yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, earlier, or last week, I had the pleasure of watching Dr. Heron present to the uh, local chapter of the NAACP, and so it was a pleasure and an honor to be there and, and to, to listen to her presentation and the questions and the dialogue that it um, inspired. And then also last week, I, had, I was able to attend the Berkeley Middle School's Write Talk event and uh, speak to two classes of eighth graders who were very excited to uh, talk about our strategic plan and 
kind of draft a outline for um, persuasive essays on things that they think that, that they should that should change about our school division. That was very good. They'd like fewer map testing, um, and uh, and more fun Fridays. So that was good good time, and they were able to connect it to the strategic plan. So. Uh, it was good. And then also last week, uh, uh, Ms. Larson and Ms. Ramsey and Mrs. Young and I visited Motoka Elementary School and had a nice, a nice tour, a nice brief tour there. So that was good to, to get in the school. Huh? Sorry? Very brief. Very brief. Yes, it was. It was good to see those little faces. Anyway, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Dr. Beers? Uh, <clears throat> I already mentioned earlier the um, two different activities that I... Uh, participated in. I wanted to mention a third one um, today, and that is um, the fact that I spent an incredible weekend in uh, Leesburg, Virginia, and also Fairfax, Virginia, attending the 2019 VHSL Division 4, 5, and 6 Wrestling Championship probably don't know this. I hope you, you'll, you'll learn more about it uh, later in the future. We had 13 students from three different high schools qualify. Now, there are only 13 weight classes, so there would only be 39 slots. And 13 of our students made that. A number of them made the semifinals. Two of them went all the way to the finals and, and just lost in the finals. And I know they were very disappointed, but they have nothing to be disappointed about. It was, uh, it, it was quite a mo mo momentous occasion to see those. Um, there were students from all over the states. I saw mothers, fathers, girlfriends, grandparents, twisted up like pretzels all across the... Um, gymnasium as they were forever trying to get their favorite son, boyfriend, grandson out of some uh, impossible predicament. And, and I think many times the pretzels worked and the kids uh, felt that and, and, uh, and got out of those difficulties. But knowing how much effort and preparation is required for this kind of athletic endeavor, and actually I do know very much what that's like. I was very proud as a WJCC board member to see how these students and their coaches conducted themselves on and off the mats. They were courteous. They were not screaming at referees. They weren't taunting their opponents. Um, it was a real honor to be around them and to talk to them afterwards. And I know in the future, sometime uh, in the not too distant future, that we'll honor all of those students uh, before the school board. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Mr. Kelly? I'd just like to thank the Tawana students again for coming today and talking about their, uh, their day on the river. I thought that was really, uh, really fun. Um, the, uh, the budget, so I appreciate everybody's hard work on the budget from the board to the staff. Um, now it's the community's turn to do some hard work and, and to bring, the, bring us their comments and, and their concerns and what they would like to see in the budget. Um, this, this is a, the school system's budget. It's the community's budget, and uh, the community is... I would say somewhat responsible for providing us their comments as well. So just want to remind the community to do that. Young. Thank you. Um, I, I've been advertising the one at uh, play fundraiser that was held at, uh, I, I know, at Jamestown High School. I attended it. It was lots of fun. Um, and I do want to tell you that uh, Mr. Harvey Stone, the theater teacher at uh, Jamestown High School, actually wrote the, the play, and uh, it was very well attended, and I believe the regionals are going to be held in North Carolina, so they did need that many. Um, I had the opportunity of uh, visiting Matoka, as uh, Ms. Cook said, um, and I also had a chance to look over the available space at, at that location, because when, when I talked to Mr. Jacobs, um, that school um, was given additional land so that it could provide some sporting uh, venues for, for the Parks and Recreation Department. So that was interesting to take a look at. Uh, also, I had a chance to visit uh, Laurel Lane with Ms. Hummel. And um, again, I want to thank Ms. Swan for taking the time out of her day. She was short of an AP. Um, 
I do appreciate our administrators and their willingness to tell us about their schools and, and walking us around, and uh, I always look forward to visiting the schools. Uh, I, I noticed today on the Matoka website that, uh, that our bus drivers are, are having to contend with uh, people who are driving past the buses when they are stopped with students unloading. Um, there, there is a law in Virginia that says that if that, those red lights are flashing, you are not to pass the bus. And since most of our roads are two lanes here in, um, in James City County, uh, you need to stop at both, both sides of the road and let the students off the bus, let them get away from the bus and, and head toward their various locations and then proceed. Um, I can't imagine anything more difficult for anyone being responsible for hitting a student. So, um, and I hope, and I know our law enforcement is out. Um, please, please obey the law on that because we want to keep our students safe. And um, that's my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Taylor? Nothing additional this evening. I'm going to be really short. Uh, it's spring break time coming up. And that means musicals. So uh, everyone needs to start putting that on your calendar. Uh, I went to see Almost Maine with Lafayette High School. That was really fun. And um, I went to Laurel Lane with Mrs. Young. And what my takeaway was from that uh, meeting, I, I always love to go to the schools, but my takeaway from that meeting is that not only do we have to be appreciative to our funding partners, uh, because this community supports us so much with their tax dollars, but also the volunteers um, of our community that give countless hours uh, doing it at every single school. At Laurel Lane, it's the, uh, the people who live at Williamsburg Landing. They have a wonderful relationship with Williamsburg Landing uh, residents that come in and give a lot of time to the students and of course I've been reading applications for admission into our undergraduate business program and I'm looking at resumes of all of our prospective students and almost you know a third of them are doing some kind of volunteering in our schools which I think is really wonderful. So I just wanted to put a, a thanks out there to our community for not only giving money through their taxes, but their time. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Um, I'd like to share, I too was able to attend Berkeley's Write Talks with Dr. Heron, and that was very fun to share with students how we use writing in our day-to-day -day lives um, as employees and school board members. I was also asked to um, talk a little bit about my day job at James Blair the same day. I wasn't able to do that, so I sent some folks from, from the um, company that I work for, but I know that James Blair was able to coordinate a, a wide range of businesses and professionals to come in and talk to their students about careers. Um, and so again, that, that partnering and engaging with our community is, is something that I think is incredible and that we do a really good job of in this division. Um, and I always appreciate hearing from our teachers association, this, and this is really great to kind of to remind us of what's important, and, and I like to think that, that we are on the same page, and so having that, that ongoing dialogue is, is very important. So moving on to um, upcoming events. We have a policy committee meeting on March 13th, 8 a.m. here in the annex, room 309. On, um, also on the 13th, 21st Century Career Ready is meeting at 3.30 in room 309 in the annex. Special Education Advisory Committee is meeting on March 9th, 14th um, at the rec center at, at 3.30. 3.30? Location also. Yeah. Might be a typo. Yeah, I would double check that. So yeah, that's typically the rec center, not the media center, and usually 6.30. So I guess stay tuned for correction on that. Um, and then upcoming meetings, uh, we have closed session on March 5th at 6 o'clock in the annex in room 309, following a public hearing on our budget. I um, encourage the, the public to come and, and share their thoughts about our budget. Um, that's at 6.30 in room 300 in the annex, following a work session. Um, immediately after that in room 300, again in the annex, and then our joint meeting with our funding partners will be held March 15th at 9 a.m. in room 300 in the annex. 
and uh, closed session on March 19th at 6 p.m. in room 123 here in Stryker with a regular meeting following that at 6.30 and um, right here in Stryker. So with that,